So welcome to the OTF Connect session, Teacher Librarians Transforming Libraries to Learning, Library Learning Commons with Diana and Melissa. Um, Di and Melissa has been teaching in Simcoe County for 24 years and currently she is with, in Simcoe County with the program in, is the program and innovation resource teacher librarian and she's also the vice president of the OSLA council and a co-chair of TALCO, our two provincial school library subject associations. And she's always learning and always traveling. And Diana is a teacher librarian at, at Agnes McPhail Public School in the TDSB and she's also the editor-in-chief of The Teaching Librarian, the official magazine of the Ontario School Library Association. She's been a teacher librarian for her entire career, 19 years and counting, and was fortunate enough to be on the writing team for the pivotal document Together for Learning. You can find her online through her blog or on Twitter at um, Ms. Molly TL, and I'll be putting her contact information. We're always really grateful to have so many people from all over Ontario to participate in these sessions. And I just want to know, Diana and Melissa, are you ready to take over? Yes, I'm just laughing at the chat already. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really liking that it's a webinar and not a video conference tonight. Um, Diana, do you want to start us off? Um, sure, Melissa, thanks. Uh, and I'll be clicking the, uh, the slides and going forward. Um, just indicate we're going to be monitoring the back channel a lot. Uh, so just indicate uh, through the symbols or through chat uh, if you have any questions, uh, if we're going too fast or slow. And here we go. Um, Melissa, our yeah. goals tonight. My turn. Yes. <laughs> Um, so what we're hoping we can do is a lot of people are busy transforming their school libraries and that looks and sounds different at different school boards. We don't know exactly which boards you're from and what stage that you're looking at, um, but we're going to try to talk and help you, guide you to some great documents that can help you with that and do some collaborative brainstorming at the end across um, some standards so that you can support your students and um, we're hoping we can use your ideas through chat, through your microphone and through, we're going to try a little text uh, typing device, you will be able to share some of your ideas with all of us. So, like our classrooms, oftentimes it's useful to do some diagnostic assessment, but don't panic. The test, even though we're get, yes, we are giving you a test, it's not a terribly hard one. And we're going to be using the polling tool right now. Um, so as Mally mentioned, it's the fourth button. And you'll notice that it's turned into an A. Um, and we're going to start with question number one, uh, which is a library learning commons is A, a flexible and responsive approach to helping schools focus on learning collaboratively. B, a whole school approach to building a participatory learning community. C, a special room with lots of technology in it. B, A and B, or E, none of the above. Can you please make your choice and let's take a peek. And look at that Mally. She is fantastic. She's already put up the <laughs> results of the poll. Um, and Mally, if you think, you, Mally, I didn't know you have the ability to read minds. So I was just going to ask you to move that down. Um, and the correct answer, <laughs> if you were wondering, uh, is D. Uh, it's both, um, depending on the document that you refer to, uh, it will use different wording about what a library learning commons is. So thank you for clearing the, uh, the test results of that one. And now we're going to look at the second one. Would you like me to read it? Or can you read it by yourself and just um, answer? And I'm seeing by the results that most people are OK with reading it on their own. And it seems like the most favorite answer is E, that a library learning commons can contain all of those things, computers, books, STEM related. And STEM, just in case, because you never know where people are at, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, math. Um, and, it, and in my board, we use the word STEAM because we add art. And I've also heard it referred to as STREAM as well with the R for research. 
So um, we've got some um, some people who have an, a basic idea about what we're talking about, but we're still going to give a quick little overview about two key documents in Canada and Ontario that help us understand what library learning commons are all about. Wait a minute. Before I do that, we have two more just kind of fun ones about those two pivotal documents. Um, so number three, where can you find Together for Learning? Once again, your polling tool is ready with A, B, and C. I'm disappointed to see that nobody thinks that it's on Melissa's bedside table or in my imagination, but yes, it is available at that website right now just in the PDF form because the Ontario School Library Association is currently revamping their website uh, and uh, we're working on making it um, compatible with Together for Learning. And we'll clear that poll. And we've got one more diagnostic for you about when leading learning was created. So go ahead and answer that one. How old is leading learning as a document? And once again, the majority do have, does have it. Um, it's actually a very new document. Leading Learning was created in 2014 by a Canada-wide network of school library professionals with the Canadian Library Association, which actually soon will not exist and will be replaced by the Canadian Federation of Library Associations. So yes, 2014, it is brand spanking new. And so we've talked about two pivotal documents here, Together for Learning and Leading Learning. And although you, many people are familiar with them, we did want to give a little overview about what they're like. And I'm going to let Melissa talk about T for L, as it's affectionately known. Thanks. So Together for Learning is the document that came out in 2010 for Ontario. And it was written in, co in collaboration with um, ministry, and but the Ontario School Library Association produced it. So it's our leading guide. And it was delivered, I think, two copies to every school, went out in, in 2010 to your principal and to the librarian at the time, or the TL. And there is some. Some of it's a little dated because of things have changed dramatically in our lives since 2010, especially around technology. But these key components are still really important to use and to refer back to. Um, it talks about having a physical and virtual space that's open and flexible and that it's a collaborative in nature. It talks a lot about equitable access, which I've used on many occasions to convince my principal, for example, that teaching kindergarten five days a week is not equitable to the grade eights who don't get to come into the library. So you can use it for all kinds of equity be equitable issues if you're um, struggling for support in that area. It definitely talks about great learning partnerships within the school, but also outside of the school. And I know I really made a point of learning how to get to my public librarians um, when I read that part about learning partnerships. And of course, it talks about technology and learning and how we need to use technology um, to, well, we call it leveraging digital in our schools now, but in, um, in 2010, it was more about using a tool to uh, capture the learning in the students. So it's still a great document. It's our Ontario document. There are, um, and it's been used by a lot of places um, outside of Ontario that they've been using it. And is there any other questions about Together for Learning? Hopefully you've seen it. It should have been mentioned in your courses when you took your library part one. If you took um, library part let one. Us know if, and also it's available. You can buy printed copies of it if you don't want to use the online uh, PDF from the Ontario School Library Association, or Ontario Library Association. So it's still a great document. It's nice and simply done. Um, 
and it's it's a really nice one to to have when you need to have those conversations with your principal. This slide is for your use to take a look at later. We won't talk about this blog post, but it's an excellent one. We found that in 2010, people were starting to rebrand and rename their libraries Learning Commons. And although we had the idea of what a Learning Commons was based on our document Together for Learning, a lot of some boards misinterpreted that Learning Commons meant just the space and that it didn't necessarily need a librarian in it. <laughs> and so there have been some schools that have called it called the library um, a Learning Commons and not decided to house it with a books or librarians, especially qualified teacher librarians. So this is a great document of talking about how we could call it the library learning commons or somehow manage, sometimes they're called media specialists, but if you keep the word library in it, um, people often understand what that means because they know that from their childhood. And we know what public libraries, how they can help. So this is just a great document to explain if you're thinking of rebranding your library because you may want to add the word library to your learning commons. And the picture, do you want to mention about who this wonderful lady is, Melissa? This is Diana Radina, I think is how we pronounce it. She's really big into maker spaces right now. And um, is she from Florida? I forget. Oh, she is stateside. And um, she has excellent, I follow her on Twitter and get lots of great ideas, especially around makerspace in the library, in the, in, um, the library learning commons. Um, but her blog post, this one particularly, was really, um, really relevant and helps, helps you understand how we sort of need to keep that word library because it indicates more to others than it does to us um, because of our shared understanding of that word. Okay, so I'm going to do um, a uh, overview of um, leading learning, and then it's going to get a little more interactive, if you can believe it. Hold on to your seats. So as we mentioned <laughs> in the um, diagnostic assessment, leading learning is a relatively new document. It was produced in 2014, and every single province and territory has some contribution to creating it, even if they did not have or do not have um, teacher librarians in their school libraries. Um, but every single province and territory um, contributed to this. Um, and uh, once again, it is uh, online, available online at the link that um, appears on the slide. And the fabulous and talented Mally will also be including this link in the text box. And once again, because we want to make sure we differentiate things, there is a print copy of Leading Learning available, and you can purchase that um, through the Ontario Library Association. They um, made a print copy um, possible for people who want to see it. Um, the cool thing about uh, Leading Learning is different from Together for Learning, um, one of the key pieces is that it's got that standards, the, the subtitle, which I don't know if you can see, uh, says it's the standards of practice for school library learning commons in Canada. Um, and uh, the neat thing, it's a very interactive document, and they've got these growth indicators. Uh, they go over, of course, the reality in Canada, um, what a library learning commons is, and why it's important right now in terms of uh, education. Um, and then they've got um, five standards, which we are definitely going to be getting into for the rest of this webinar, and the growth indicators, um, all positively phrased. I hope you'll, you'll notice that. We're not talking about Ds, Cs, Bs, and As. Um, but exploring, emerging, evolving, established, and leading. And you can find that on page 9 and 10 of the print copy of, um, of the document. Uh, and it's OK to be wherever you are on this continuum um, for the standards. The great thing about, uh, one of the other things we really like about, about uh, leading learning is that it's got a guide um, which goes over and describes 
um, the different um, categories, the five standards, and give examples about what um, emerging, evolving, and established are. And the truly amazing thing is that they've got examples, practical examples from the field um, from all over Canada. And um, in the website, all those see it in action are hyperlinks. All you have to do is click on it, and it will take you there, and you can see the example. So what we've provided here, because we're going to be using, because leading learning is um, the most recent of uh, documents, uh, we've provided, uh, we're going to use uh, it as one of the pivotal points for the rest of this webinar. And we've got a, a copy of an action plan for you. Um, we're going to give you some time to explore the actual website. And then we're going to be returning back to the webinar and uh, going over a little bit more about what these standards look like, sound like, feel like. Um, and we're going to be crowdsourcing a little bit about some of the answers to figure out how to get further along that continuum. So let me peek. Nope, I went too far. Um, so, so um, you, yes, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I was just going to add, this is, if you um, are a Google board, and even if you're not, you can still access um, this page. It's actually the copy of Action Plan for me. When you get the the link, you'll be able to see, oh, Mally's already put it in. It's a copy, so a working document. And all the teacher librarians in my school board are working on this this year so that they're ready for September. So they're looking at where is my library learning commons now in these five standards? And then where do they want to go? And then we're working together on how might we get there. So everyone is working their way through this as their standard that they can take to their, especially at TPA time, to uh, give to your principal to talk about how you're long range planning. Because sometimes our administrators need to be aware of the things we do in the background and that do highlight these five standards. Because sometimes our principals think we're only doing one of these standards or two. So um, you're welcome to share this document. It's a copy from page 32 of the leading learning document. Um, and make your own copy and use it to, to sort of assess your library and where you are. And we understand that not everybody that's participating tonight is actually in a library. In fact, some of you are in boards that um, have library technicians as opposed to teacher librarians. And that's okay because the nice thing about uh, leading learning is although we do recommend um, having school library professionals in school libraries, there are still things that everyone can do because it is not just the responsibility of the teacher librarian to push the learning forward. So I'm going to call your attention to the chat. And underneath the, um, the, the do uh, Google Doc link, there is the CLA Toolbox link. So um, we are going to be giving you five minutes. And I know that seems like a short time, but one of the things we, we mentioned in promoting this webinar is the question was, well, when do you have or when do people have the time to investigate and explore these pivotal documents? Right now, we're giving you the time. And I want to stress that you don't have to read the whole document. It's OK to look through pieces. So. Uh, we're going to ask you, and the wonderful and talented Mally will be putting on a timer um, with five minutes. It'll go from um, to give us a signal about when you need to return to the webinar. But we're going to ask you to go to the CLA toolbox and um, do some exploring, especially around I'm going to move it back again to uh, some of those um, see it in action and looking at some of those standards. Um, what, yes, what questions do you have oh. before we set you loose? And Melissa, what comments do you think we need to make before we set them loose for this five minute time? I just want to make sure that you can, you know how to navigate through the document. So if there's a question you have about you know, there are standards, there are themes, there's the, you know, emerging, evolving, established. So if you've got um, an idea of how it's 
the structure of the document. If you have a question about that, I'm sure we could help you out with that today and, and you won't be the only one asking that question. Um, and then hopefully you can at least click on a link or two and they'll see it in action to see that there's some great practical examples that you might be able to use in your workplace now. So Maui has put the timer. Right. You can see it at the top there. So we encourage you, um, so don't close the Blackboard Collaborate. Open, you know, make sure it goes to a, a new window or a new tab. Uh, click on the link that uh, we've provided, the CLA toolbox, and you've got five minutes to um, explore leading learning. This is where it gets really quiet, but that's because everybody's working. Just letting people know um, you've got about 45 seconds until the timer goes off. Okay, folks, hopefully you have heard the timer go off. If you could please indicate that you are back with us in the webinar by raising your hand, that would be fantastic. And there are just two people uh, left to chime in. One person left to chime in. And hopefully um, Wilma will be able to join us uh, in a bit. Um, you can comment. We'd love to hear your comments about what you thought of the document. Was this your first time checking out Leading Learning? Um, what were your thoughts about the organization, about um, what it looks like, what sort of things you saw? Uh, feel free to add that to the back channel. Um, what we're going to be doing now is looking together in more depth into each of the standards. So I'm going to start with the first standard that's in the document called Facilitating Collaborative Engagement to Cultivate and Empower a Community of Learners. And when Diana and I were planning this, we uh, we thought that the uh, it would be great just to give a couple of examples of a print resource that's available to you that kind of fits that category and a digital resource that you could easily use or um, learn to access to uh, start with that collaboration. And then we also thought it's all about the people sometimes. It's those relationships you can build with others to engage in that collaboration. So in our first slide, talking about facilitating collaboration, um, we've got um, Innovator's Mindset and a picture book about Stone Soup, about coming together to collaborate. And uh, I had a great question at, a, at a, a workshop the other day. Somebody said, well, what's the difference between group work and collaboration? And I said, well, group work means you take one person's idea and everybody runs with it. Collaboration is we get an idea started and people build on it. And when you get into the project, People don't really remember who first started it. You, you're constantly building on and improving on someone else's idea. And so the ability to collaborate is so important. And I'm finding as a Google board, we've had that great opportunity in the last two years to use Google Docs to do that. If you're not a Google board, you have OneDrive probably and other places where you can do um, collaboration. 
And the next slide is just a simple example of a Padlet that I can dem demonstrate. This is just um, a digital resource we actually are using for a presentation this spring. And this is different reasons people blog, and we're collecting them onto a Padlet. So if you've never used Padlet before, it's great because you don't have to be all part of the same school board. It um, is interactive, user-friendly, lots of different varieties of visual to share. Kids can use it, teachers can use it. Um, but it's a great way to make a digital electronic bulletin board. So you can have lots of different ideas and a, and a great example of, um, of collaboration because as people see one idea, they can build on it and come up with a different, um, different style or a different idea of that. And the third way you can do some collaborating is through your human resources. So connecting to your public librarian is amazing if you haven't had a chance to do that. Um, I have the fortunate experience of living in Barrie and the Innisfil Library. If you have been to OLA in the last three years, you know about the Innisfil Library, the Idea Lab. It's probably one of the best in Canada, and it's just a 15-minute drive from my home. They have a great maker space. Um, to, that we absolutely love and we've managed to make quite a number of partnerships with our schools and that library. And um, a lot of our li public libraries are becoming really involved. For example, another public library in Angus is going to be part of our Maker Fair in, um, in two weeks. So we're starting to make those really neat connections with the community. Another great example of a human resource, if you haven't seen uh, Leah Castle, Castleman, uh-oh. Do you remember her name, Diana? The Digital Human Library. Amazing uh, resource. I've forgotten. It's, it's Leah. Her um, amazing resource about um, she's connecting experts from all around the world that will willingly come into your school to, and do a Skype presentation. Um, so if you're studying animals, you can get an expert from the Toronto, Toronto Zoo or um, hear about somebody who's studying in the Arctic. It's amazing um, the range of people she has who are experts in their field willing to share what they know with students in your class. And the great, so thing, really the great thing is that Mally has close to her name, once again it is Lee Castle, and she has Thank also you. done an OTF Connects recording, uh, which Mally will cite um, probably in the back channel. Great. Thank you, Mally. So, Now's the time for you to do some work. What we would like you to do is contribute, um, if you've got great ideas of how to collaborate either a print resource or a digital resource or a human resource that you um, feel is a really great tool that you're using in your area that others could maybe try. And there's three different ways that you can uh, share what you would like to suggest. So you can choose to click on the little toolbar in the middle of your screen. There's a little text box. Enter text on the page, and you can actually type right onto the document, so right onto the slide. You could choose to add it in the chat, or you could raise your hand and use your microphone. So is there anybody else who has some great ideas of how they collaborate in their, leading, in their learning library? So once again, feel free to um, contribute in any way that you feel most comfortable with. Uh, raise your hand, type in the back channel, or use the text tool, which is the third square in your tool library, the one with the A in the lines, and click anywhere on this red slide to add your thoughts about what other things could um, seed collaboration. Thanks very much. We've seen uh, somebody type Lino. Yeah. And we uh, saw somebody else type Google Apps. Thank you, thank you. Just in case somebody hasn't heard of Lino, could whoever um, typed that uh, either in the, um, the chat or through your microphone elaborate a bit on that?
Marriott has also added to the um, the uh, group chat Global Read Aloud, a fantastic uh, a fantastic resource. Mm -hmm. uh, Vicky in the back channel. Um, I'm just doing this, by the way, folks, not because I don't think you can read, but because when we archive this, we want to make sure that the participants later actually get to capture some of the amazing things that you crowdsourced and mentioned. So Vicky wrote, uh, Lino is like a set of post-it notes on a virtual bulletin board. It's very similar to Padlet, I would presume. Um, That's great. Marriott contributed the Grobo uh, Read Aloud. And I'm just scrolling through the chat. Um, Mally has contributed the, the mention about the twice collaborations, Polycom, um, with a, a link. Sophie has written VROC.ca. And Melissa's mentioned about the seniors connecting with elementary students to tell their stories. Robin has said, if you're introducing the idea of collaboration with the TL to your staff, he's got a Google Sites that he's um, um, listed. So thank you so much, Robin, for contributing that. Maui has elaborated a bit to say twice collaborations read around the planet. And she's included a link. All right, looks like some great ideas that we've got here. We're going to pop to the next slide, but just because we're there doesn't mean that um, uh, the learning stops. Um, if you have other uh, things, please continue to uh, share them in the back channel, and we can always return to them. Um, uh, Kristen has mentioned about the Google site not working. So uh, if Robin could double check that, um, maybe it's a permissions issue. I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Uh, achieving this, advancing the learning community to achieve school goals. So this is the second standard, and I find um, what I'm supporting teacher librarians, and they're talking about their TPA. This is a great one to focus in on about how you support as the as you work in the li in the library learning commons. How do you support those school goals that are happening in your school? So uh, we just take an example of a print document of a school learning plan from TDSB. And then in Simcoe County, we're using a digital one this year. So all of our school learning stories, we're calling them, that you do when you take do an inquiry on a PD day or a PD session are being linked back to our school learning plans. And everybody from every other school can see those plans. So we're having a really nice way of visualizing what others are doing. And it's a nice switch from the principal writing the plan in September and everybody doing it. The principal kind of has a shell. And then we add to it all year as students and teachers. Um, human resources, the one big thing is thinking about how to collaborate with your principal on meeting those goals. So a couple of really simple ideas to advance school goals is to have PLCs in the library so that you are available to attend them so you can see what's happening as a school projection um, overall and get that school idea of what's being expected. And um, encouraging your admin to, to get teachers to collaborate with you in the school library so that um, sometimes that's all a teacher needs to hear is if a principal says, collaborate once with your teacher librarian during the year or with your library tech. And that's all they need to um, start that teamwork or that co-teaching with you. The other thing that um, teacher librarians are very good at, at least in my board, is accessing resources outside of their school. So if you have central resource teachers or consultants or you know of special programs or grants, the teacher librarian can connect um, their classroom teachers to those to those um, goals. So if you're trying to work on a math objective, you might have the resource teacher or the math resource teacher um, come to your school. So those are kind of the nice ways that uh, you can help. And I know in our board, 
inquiry, getting Google Apps running in our schools, and our maker spaces have been three large initiatives that have happened in the last couple of years. And those have all been um, part of the professional development for teacher librarians in the last two years. And they are also um, key support people in school. So if a teacher librarian is well trained and knows about those things, then they can really support their teachers to, uh, to pick up that momentum and to take on those new initiatives. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Or is there anybody else who can think of an idea of how they might help achieve those school goals at your school? I just want to call attention to some of the human resources. Um, but yes, of course, we've put the principal in there. Um, uh, but that other image, that old puny one, uh, mentioned about teacher librarians, but I also want to remind you about the other specialist teachers in your building. Um, because uh, oftentimes, when we think about um, working as a group, we think about the classroom teachers. Um, but those specialist teachers also have so much to offer um, to achieving the school goals uh, in meaningful ways. So don't forget your specialist teachers. For example, in our in my um, in our school board, we're rolling out a big STEAM initiatives. So you know, having dot and dash robots are a great thing. Well, it's great if you use the French teacher who teaches grades four to eight to get involved in that, because you know that a whole bunch of kids are going to have access to those resources instead of just tagging one grade. Um, so when the the FSL teacher is using robots in French you're really helping to get that out to everybody. Thank you to whoever wrote a That's super a conference as well. Yay. I, um, we, every year you can invite your administrator to come to the OLA conference for free if you're registered. And I strongly encourage you to do that because every time an administrator from my school board goes to the OLA conference. They're amazed by all the learning that's happening. And you get a real pulse of where you are and where your district is compared to the rest of the province. And um, they have always come back being more supportive of their teacher librarians. Um, and thanks, Sue, again in the chat. Uh, Yes. If your school has a planning committee, make sure the TL is included. The easiest thing is to hold, hold it in the library. <laughs> and you'll notice that a lot of the tools, the print resources, digital and human resources, overlap with the standards. So the nice thing, we, for the purposes of our webinar, we've separated and delineated them. But that's not necessarily the case. You can use um, one tool to achieve many of the goals. Um, and the wonderful Mally has placed the uh, OLA Super Conference link in the back channel as well. And if you haven't been to the OLA Super Conference in the last year or two, what happens is everybody who presents archives their resources there. So you can actually go back and mine it for different um, of goals. So if you know you're just starting a makerspace this year and you want to go back a year or two years to see what people were saying about makerspaces, you're welcome to go and access um, those archives. And there's some really great resources available to you. Um, oh, I was just going to ask one question. Next year? We all know what these school goals will be in every board. <laughs> M-A-T-H. So if anyone has any great ideas or suggestions about that, that would be a great way to think about how you can support your school um, classrooms, specifically in math strategies or in problem solving and those kinds of ideas. Um, that's going to be a really big link we'll need to make as um, those who work in the school library. And it is possible. And it, the more ways that you can fit 
uh, school library into school goals, the more powerful and pivotal it becomes. Uh, I'm just thinking about something that just happened two days ago in my library where the kindergartens and I uh, ended up doing an impromptu math congress because we were working on something that for media that was related to drama because we're preparing for spring concert. And we had students talking about if makeup was um, an example of media. And then they helped calculate how much makeup we needed to buy for each of the three kindergarten classes so that they would have enough mm -hmm. for the concert. It was pretty impressive. And the neat thing is, we didn't necessarily intend it to, but it did achieve all those school goals in terms of literacy and numeracy um, and all those other really good things. I've linked our PD sessions for teacher librarians this year to wellness and equity, and we had an equity in the library uh, inquiry that went on this year. Great topics, totally fits the library. So. Um, those are things that you may find that you're doing anyways, but maybe just highlight so that your administrators are aware of what you're doing to support wellness in your school. And I just want to call attention to what uh, Kristen said in the back channel. If it's OK, Kristen, for me to read that for you. The OAME conference this year, which is actually next week, has a session put on by Ridgeview Public School in Peel and how they are integrating math into the library. Fantastic. And it's up here in Georgian College next week. Well, Lisa also makes a great point, too. Forgive me for reading it, but once again, just for archive purposes. Uh, Lisa writes, great point with math. In my board, Hamilton, we have recently had several Syrian students enroll, and math is how we are often able to make them feel connected, as it is something that they understand should be integrated in more, though. Agreed. Okay. Thank you so much, people, by the way, once again, for contributing in the way you are to the back channel. Um, I hope people are familiar with the OAME conference. Um, and Mally is quickly trying to find the There's that Mally. She's got the link to the math conference <laughs> if you are interested in it. Mally is amazing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the third standard here, which is the cultivating effective instructional design to co-plan, teach, and assess learning. And I don't know about you, this is one of my favorite parts of being a teacher librarian, is being able to work alongside other uh, educators to design some incredible learning experiences that uh, the students enjoy and I enjoy just as much as, as the teachers do. Um, there are some fantastic print resources uh, just for the purposes of the slide. We couldn't fit them all in, but we uh, included um, two favorite titles, the one about comprehension and collaboration by Stephanie Harvey, uh, as well as IQ, A Practical Guide to Inquiry-Based Learning. Um, this is written by a TDSB uh, teacher, Jennifer Watts, so we're very proud of her in TDSB. Um, great resource, once again, not just for teacher librarians or school library professionals, but for any um, teacher uh, about inc uh, including inquiry-based learning into their program. Um, Melissa has talked a lot about uh, GASP, Google Apps for Education, as a great digital resource for um, all these stages about co-planning. Um, we did a lot of our co-planning through Google Docs, and the comment feature is uh, extremely useful. I know I used it with my own children. My daughter is 16, and my son is 13, and they will share documents with me and ask for feedback, and the comment feature is fantastic because it's a great way to track that descriptive feedback. Um, and uh, the human resources, of course, um, Skype, uh, I think was mentioned either in the back channel or as one of the examples that Melissa had. And getting together, once again, not just with your school but beyond, the little mini picture over there is uh, of myself and the incredible author, Richard Scrimger, as well as other teacher librarians. And the uh, lady on the right is uh, Toronto Public Library, Annalise Isabella. Um, the, the group of us uh, plan an annual Red Maple marketing campaign uh, based on the 
uh, Red Maple books from the Forest of Reading for that year. The grade seven and eight students uh, actually designed their own marketing campaign. And then um, we have actual advertising executives come to judge the projects. Um, they're just, they blow us away every single year. Um, so once again, think about not just involving other professionals and educators when you co-plan, co-teach, and co-assess, but your students as well. Um, I wanted to highlight a tool uh, over here um, called Adobe Voice. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, but at my school um, in the PDSB, um, especially our youngest classes, the kindergartens, mm -hmm. have absolutely fallen in love with this tool because it's a great way to capture the learning, um, both visually and orally, uh, uh, and quite simple to use, easy enough that the kindergartens themselves can do it without a lot of help from the teacher. Um, so I've got a couple of examples here. Um, we had a, a big uh, fairy tale expo with the kindergartens, and uh, some used uh, Adobe Voice um, and other technical tools to retell the story of the three Billy Goats Gruff. Um, and it's not just retelling other people's stories, but telling their own. Um, one of the other kindergarten initiatives uh, a couple of years ago was about um, resolutions. So what does it mean? Um, to make a resolution, and it tied in with goal setting. Um, and uh, this particular student uh, made her resolution on Adobe Voice. And what's particularly wonderful about this is this is a student who was a non-speaker in class. So these digital resources help uh, students who might, for one reason or another, be reticent to speak um, to become more involved. Um, now he is asking if uh, you would like to see the video. And I'm going to check with the crowd. Crowd, can you use your thumbs up or thumbs down? Um, that's under the first button, approval or disapproval. Um, would you like to see the video of uh, Hannah talking about her resolution? So I'm seeing two. Two thumbs up. And a lot of not sures, or at least not uh, indicating here. So uh, once again, um, approval is a thumbs up. Disapproval, I don't mean it as disapproval of us. But if you would like to see the example of the Adobe Voice, please indicate with a thumbs up approval or a thumbs down disapproval. And, uh, and Marriott has also said yes. So, sure. Um, but this is where I'm going to turn to, oh my goodness, Mally is so awesome. OK, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> and Her jet lag is gone. Right. I'm going to let the Adobe voice talk. Now, I'll just need you to press the play button, which is just right under the picture. Were you able to see that? You should have been able to um, either click on the link or I showed, it, I showed the video, so I can show it again. Were you able to see it? Right now, I just see the opening screen. And I see the little play button and the 0 0.00 out of 0 0.18 seconds. OK, so maybe I, I guess on this one, on Adobe Voice, you might need to press the play button yourself or go to the link, um, the Adobe Voice link, and uh, it will play from your browser. But I'll play it again. Here you go. OK, it's not playing on mine, but I can see Melissa says it's playing on hers. Um, so we can give you, because we're doing actually quite well time-wise. Um, so if you would like to take the 18 seconds uh, to click the link that Mally has supplied in the back channel. Um, but, so feel free to click the link. Um, we'll just give you, I said, 30 seconds, because it's a very short video.
Okay, I'm going to ask Maui if she could uh, get the screen back to our um, our webinar. Fantastic. And I'm going to just move back a slide to see if there are any people who wanted to contribute other ideas in terms of um, print, digital, or human tools that you find useful for co-planning, teaching, and assessing. So Lisa has mentioned in the, um, in the chat, she says, similar in my board, I've seen explain everything used in a similar way. I agree with you, Lisa. Sue has also um, echoed the sentiment, mentioning explain everything. I want to capture what Wilma said earlier in the chat. She mentioned Forest of Reading has media contests for students to enter. Sue mentioned earlier in the chat, she wrote, I believe that Watt and Kohler have a new book on inquiry aimed at the junior level. Not sure of the title. The title actually is Think Q which I will try and type on the slide. It's a great resource. I've had a chance to look at it already. Uh, Robin has mentioned Google Hangouts are there's something. And Wilma has mentioned <laughs> Read and Write works well with all research. We do a lot of uh, Read and Write as well, Wilma. That is a great uh, a great digital tool. And uh, Robin mentions Google Hangouts work quite well when you can't meet face to face. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody, for once again continuing to contribute. And I'm going to flip to the fourth standard. So this standard is the one that we all think about when we first go into the library as a teacher librarian or as a library tech. Yes, I'm going to encourage kids to read and get people reading and make sure teachers have read alouds all the time. So this one is usually the easiest one for us to um, think about, but it also means a lifelong learner and to me that really pulls in the inquiry that's happening in schools. So if you haven't seen the book Q Tasks, I highly recommend it by Carolyn Koshlin. Um, great way to get kids asking really good, deep questions, or thick questions, some people call them. Um, and that can really motivate or get kids engaged in their inquiry that they're going to do. The other great thing that was already highlighted was about the Forest of Reading program. So even if your libraries don't have the teacher librarian, um, Organizing a forest of reading program in your school, you can still participate as a classroom teacher or have um, a forest of reading program going as a parent volunteer could be organizing it. So there's other ways that you can start that forest of reading program in your schools. And it has all different age groups. One of the favorite things I got to do today, for example, in my role, I got to go and measure, um, do some podcasts. We had some kindergarten students giving their book reviews about the Blue Spruce books they read. And so well, now I get to edit their little podcasts, which will be fun. Um, but they were really excited and it was great for them. And for them to learn what an audio, like a podcast was, versus a video, that was a really interesting thing. For example, they say this book and they'd have to explain, they'd have to give the title of the book. So it was a great way to get kids to get put more detail into their text. 
Um, but there's so many neat things you can do with the reading program. I've also really have enjoyed how Blogger has started to catch on in our school board, especially for writing and for writing what you've learned and commenting. So we're really trying to get kids. We've done some forest of reading blogging this year. And um, one great example is a grade three uh, Silver Birch Express group. They're blogging about a book. Tank and Fizz, and I happen to know the author, so I email Liam, and he goes and he puts a comment on the kid's blog about his book. So when they got to see that comment from the author, they were over the moon and highly motivated to keep writing. So blogging is a really great opportunity to increase kids' ability to read to write, only because they're motivated to write more. And of course, it's just like practicing. To play basketball well, you need to practice. Same with writing. Um, another um, great resource that foster lifelong learning is if you haven't used Twitter as a professional learning tool, I highly recommend it. It's something to try out if you haven't experienced it before, because that's where our lifelong learners are learning about all kinds of things. It doesn't even have to be related to your professional world. It could be maybe knitting, maybe another hobby that you have. There are experts in those fields and in those hobbies. So teaching kids that you are learning outside of the classroom is a great way to show everyone how to be a lifelong learner. Um, and Diana, I forget what that, that's an author visit, I believe. In that photo? Actually, this one has to do with the fact that literacy is more than just letters and numbers. Um, in, in leading learning, they talk about literacy, leadership, engaging readers, information literacy, critical literacy, digital literacy and citizenship, cultural literacy, and literacy partners. Uh, this, is, um, this is our Just Dance Club. And it's the teachers as well mm -hmm. as the students using the library uh, for their own physical literacy and being able to be active uh, and, and improve their, their mental health and well-being. And we're having a lot, of, um, a lot of schools getting into mindfulness, and that's another great thing that can be done really uh, effectively in the library as well, is learning how to be more mindful and having those quiet moments. Uh, I thought I would highlight one of the digital resources called Teach Ontario. I'm not sure if you're aware. It was launched recently, although they've had a soft working project for about a year or two. In the um, Teach Ontario website, which is owned by TVO and funded by the ministry, there are a number of um, opportunities to find curated materials, to explore different topics. There's um, workshops online book clubs online, and there's one section called Share. And this is where you can build your own sharing community. So if you want to um, work with others or, or learn more about another area, it's all these are all um, teachers who work in Ontario. So they, your sign up is free as long as you use a school board email. And um, it's a great way to have a discussion of pe from people all around the province. So if you haven't tried Teach Ontario, I would highly recommend that you give it a try. It's growing by the week in what groups are there, but it's super easy to start your own group if you wanted to have your own um, local kind of virtual site, you're welcome to do this, or you can join somebody else's site that's already begun. Is there any other questions we have about uh, late? Uh, once again, feel free, ways that you feel here. free. We've been in, in the back channel, Melissa. People have been sharing their Twitter IDs. Um, some people are considering actually joining Twitter, which is great. Um, uh, we've been talking about the, um, the green screens and about the tools that are being used for green screen. And no apologies, Lisa, necessary. Uh, we were talking about which software mm -hmm. we use and do ink seems to be a popular one for um, doing green screen technology. If you haven't used it recently, they have updated it nicely so you can um, 
you can change the size of your image so you can fit it into your background a lot easier. So if you used it a year or so and it was a little awkward, it's a lot better now. And if you're new to Twitter, you just have to follow one person and start seeing who they follow. And you don't have to uh, make any comments right away. You can just start to see, you know, oh, that was a good idea. I wonder what their story is about. Click on the bio of the person and see if they were, you know, if it connects with, if you resonate with them. Otherwise, you move on. Um, Wilma and Mark um, are in the chat also mentioned a tool called Shadow Puppet or Shadow Puppet EDU. Um, as a, a really useful tool that they like. It's a great engaging uh, uh, app, great way to do some assessment. Okay, with your permission, um, I'm going to jump into the uh, the SIS standard here, which is designing learning environments to support participatory learning. Um, because we, we are going through paradigm shifts right now. It, and working together uh, and being involved, not just passive garbage in, garbage out, but being active contributing members of your learning community, that is, as it says in Leading Learning, that's the new norm. Um, so you need to make sure we've got things like uh, security and privacy and good digital citizenship. Some great print resources. We were talking about uh, STEM and maker spaces. And um, one person that, uh, in addition to Diana Rendina, who is absolutely lovely, um, I'm also a really big fan of Laura Fleming. Um, and she uh, answers tons of questions, does tons of webinars, and has also made written her own book called Grove of Making, Best Practices for Establishing a Makerspace for Your School. Um, so uh, makerspaces are just one of many ways that you can um, develop and encourage that participatory learning. Um, we've also mentioned this invent to learn. Um, once again, along that makerspace um, focus, making tinkering and engineering in the classroom. Um, under the digital resources, we've got uh, Makey Makey, uh, often known as the, you know, make a banana into a piano. Uh, but it is so much more than, than that. Um, and we've got um, one of my school's favorite tools, which is Minecraft. So I'm going to pop to the next slide just for a second. Um, just in case people don't know what Minecraft is, it is a uh, open-ended sandbox type of video game. A sandbox uh, being that you decide what you're going to do in it. And it, I've heard it compared to having an infinite box of Legos, um, virtual Lego that you can explore, you can build, you can break, you can fight, you can do all sorts of things. Um, at my school, Agnes McPhail Public School in PDSB, we have been using Minecraft for five years now. We're actually some pretty early adopters there. And I'm part of a group of educators called the Gaming Edus, um, which you can, um, we have a, a website, gamingedus.org, uh, where we share some of our adventures and what we've been doing. And uh, we use Minecraft, a video game, um, in many ways, both for uh, club purposes as well as integrated with the curriculum. Um, so the images that you see on this slide here, uh, the jousting tournament, that was the students during a club organizing themselves and creating this. At first I thought, what are they doing? Are they, are they just fighting? But you really do need to um, have an open mind when it comes to using game-based learning and video games um, in your library learning commons or in your school. And it turns out that, no, they weren't quote, quote, just fighting, they were actually organizing this tournament with rules and regulations and equipment, um, many different things that you can do in Minecraft, uh, students creating and building several things. And what I like is not just replicating things that they've seen, like recreate a pioneer village or, you know, recreate, but also imagining the what ifs. 
uh, and so expanding their own creativity and imagination. Um, and that includes even creating something like a pig racing course. So the, the lower box over there, the students found out, because there are tons of um, videos and books and things like that, uh, that tells you about all the different things you can do in Minecraft. And you can ride pigs. So my students created a pig racing course. Um, you can read tons of stuff about Minecraft. In fact, we could do a whole session about Minecraft. In fact, I am doing a session about Minecraft uh, thanks to uh, Expo. Um, so take a look at the, uh, the Summer Academy listed online, um, linked with OTS. Um, other human resources, it's already been mentioned, but as we said, um, a lot of these tools can go with all five standards. Super Conference, OLA Super Conference, a fantastic way to develop your participatory learning. Um, great places to be inspired in terms of creativity and innovation. Um, and I'm going to check the back channel, and Melissa has been monitoring the back channel. And I'm also going to invite you to Pretty. invite you to add once again through the chat, through your hands, or through typing on the text box or on the slide your own ideas about developing participatory. Oh my gosh, I couldn't say that. Participatory learning. <laughs> um, another side effect to going to the super conference is visiting the vendors and the expo, and I've had great uptake in connecting with publishers or booksellers who um, will give me advanced reading copies and the kids, my kids will review them for them and then give them feedback. And so kids are really motivated to read the book, first of all, because it's not even out yet and they get an early copy of it. But they also um, get to give authentic feedback back to a publisher or back to an author. And um, it's a whole other kind of a little mini way to get, get blogging going and getting um, and promoting books and reading that um, I've really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Well, well, tons of freebies, you're right. Yeah, and I just put in the, the chat box and I'll add it to the uh, resource section as well. There was a whole um, hour and a half session on um, Minecraft. I'm just looking for who it was by, um, by Brian Aspinall, and guaranteed it'll be incredible. So um, I'm, I've, I'm adding, I've added it to the chat, and I'll also add it to the resource page as well. Thanks, Molly. You're doing an amazing job of uh, throwing these links down. Um, just to add, um, Robin has mentioned some of our gamer kids use Minecraft to build molecules for their science class. Great example. And I love it when it's the students that take the initiative um, and decide, hey, I can use this to do that. And, Great question, um, Mary. Yeah, I was Mariette. Mariette has a really good question. Do you have any suggestions on? Um, yeah, if, does anyone have, have a job description commons? about a makerspace in the Learning Commons? Ours, if our teacher librarian is part of that STEAM team, that makerspace is often developed in their library, but it's just part of the role of the teacher librarian. So we wouldn't have a specific job description, um, but it may be. Um, a specific planning time teacher's role in other schools. So I'd be really interested if, if someone did have that job description. Um, in the, um, the Teaching Librarian magazine, um, I think not last issue, but the issue before, we had an um, article about um, uh, developing makerspaces in the school library. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't have a job description, but um, a lot of the literature that you can read can lend itself towards creating it. But that would be a very fascinating thing to create. Yeah, and Diana, do you have a link to the um, to the magazine? Is it an online presence at all, or is it just published? Uh, yes, it is, and I will stick that in the chat. 
because that might be a really good uh, a good document for people to look at, especially if they're looking to uh, start Makerspace in their um, library. Mm -hmm. And it's also, um, there's all kinds of different resources, so it's not just about Makerspace. So it, and it gives you an idea of what's happening around the province. Now, naturally, I'm terribly biased because I'm the editor-in-chief of this magazine. Uh, but we, we love um, the, the quality of um, articles that we get is great. Um, and considering that almost everybody involved with the teaching librarian um, is a volunteer, from the editorial board members to the writers. Um, and uh, and contributors. So, if any of you are school library professionals, I would highly, highly encourage you to get involved yourself into some participatory learning and contribute an article to um, the teaching librarian. I'll put my email just in case you have an article idea burning within you, like. <laughs> that idea about creating that job description, that would make a really cool article. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about looking at some of those digital tools, does anyone have any um, other digital tools that they've used um, in, their, in their libraries or something that they've collaborated on with another teacher that you've introduced with your students? Maybe we could share some of those as well. And I can add those to the resource. This is one area where a lot of people are very interested in redesigning their learning environments. So um, participatory learning can be even in the furniture that you select or the stand-up desks to sit-down desks, um, classroom, or instead of having a lab where the computers face the wall, they're now set in collaborative tables. So they're facing each other with maybe a big screen at the end of the table. So there's lots of neat ways of reorganizing your space to improve participation and collaboration. And another um, resource that I can mention um, that exists, and it's Canada-wide, so if you want to make sure you sort of get beyond the Ontario perspective, it's Treasure Mountain Canada. Treasure Mountain Canada is a think tank, um, or as it's described on its web page, which I'm going to try and pull a Maui and actually put the link in right away. <laughs> so I'm, I'm being inspired by Mally. That's very important. Um, Treasure Mountain is visioned as an extension of a research retreat project uh, originally called Treasure Mountain in the U.S. Um, and uh, they happen um, every two years in a different location in Canada. Um, we recently, uh, in 2016, had it in Toronto. But it's been in Victoria and Edmonton. And I think the other one was in Ottawa if I'm not mistaken. Um, yep. And the wonderful thing is, once again, you can't make it. If you go to the Treasure Mountain um, uh, website there, it has links to all the papers and all the um, ideas that were shared at Treasure Mountain Canada. And again, the best participatory learning I've had is attending and being a presenter or um, at the OSLA at the OLA conference every year, and applications to put in a proposal for uh, presentations are due at the end of May. So if you think you are interested in participating, we are always looking for great uh, conference presenters. And you can have uh, two or three people come, so you don't have to do it on your own. Um, great learning opportunities. Um, I just want to share an idea that Wilma shared in the chat in terms of um, other tools. Um, Wilma mentioned Pit Collage and Voki. 
which are great for student participatory learning. I agree 100%, Wilma. Uh, Bulky is fantastic, and I love the different um, creatures and people that you can use to talk for you. And I think it's Bulky.com. If I'm not, uh, if I'm correct or not correct, Wilma, please correct me in the chat. Um, and Pick Collage is, I think, of a, a similar URL. I'm not certain, but please correct me. And have you ever tried, tried um, Chatter Picks? It's a super easy app to use. Kids can catch on, and adults love it too. Um, I've loved it for exit tickets because it's a really quick way kids can take a picture of their artwork, then have their art talk about what they learned. And it's a really great, ego, um, engaging way to get an exit ticket um, from kids. OK, we're getting to the uh, last 10 minutes of our uh, webinar tonight. And we wanted to make sure that this was as interactive and as involved a presentation as possible. Um, so we wanted to check with you, the participants, to see um, what other things were you hoping that we would have mentioned that we didn't? Um, what other burning topics do you have? Uh, what questions do you have about leading learning or together for learning um, or anything about library learning comments? And once again, feel free to use your mic or the chat, or your hands. We also want to tell you that we're hoping the conversation doesn't end with tonight. We would love to stay in touch with you. Um, and uh, as we said, continue the conversation. Uh, we listed our Twitter IDs as well as our email. So feel free to um, email us with uh, comments or questions and uh, other piece. We also have um, social media presence in other areas. Um, our blogs are mentioned, um, as well as uh, I have my share space where I post lesson plans and other assorted goodies. Um, Robin has mentioned he would like to talk a little bit about overcoming barriers to collaboration. So let's talk about that. So Robin, is that about not being able to get everybody into the school library that you're hoping to? or? Um, is it because of the size of your school library, or is it just that people don't see the advantage to working with you? Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> Uh, Robin mentioned, just in case for those just listening to the audio, um, it's about um, uh, shifting the teacher paradigm of teacher isolation. And once again, Melissa and I are not experts. Uh, we've been in the library for a long time, and that's why we really would like to welcome other participants to chime in as well. Um, my, my initial reaction to it is it takes time. And uh, picking a couple of key people to work with and being able to share your successes is a very helpful way. Sometimes I wish we could do it faster because sometimes those people that we work really well with and collaborate well with go to other schools or retire or get surplus, especially in high school. Um, uh, but uh, continuing to um, choose a few and hoping and uh, that by sharing the results, it gets more people interested and encouraged to take the leap with you. Any other um, suggestions with this, folks? I, 
I also find that um, if you can encourage your administrator to help people get planning time at the same time, if there's two grades, teaching grade five, if they have one prep period together, they're much more likely to come and collaborate with you. And I don't expect a big long planning session. It's often collaborating on the fly. So um, I'm often finding out what people need by being in the staff room and hearing what they're talking about. I don't assume people are going to fill out my questionnaire about what they're doing. Sometimes I have to go and be more, we call it the stealth librarian from Kate, um, that you have to kind of find out what people are doing and then help them find those resources or connect them to the right people to solve a problem for them. I know my biggest sell is if I could do some assessment or um, do a little bit of marking when the kids are in their room and so I give some comments back to the teacher. That feedback on their students seems to go a long way in getting teachers to come back to see you. Mariette has also contributed an answer to this question. She says relationships. Mm -hmm. True, Wilma. Relationships. No people listen. If they trust you, there is more chance. Um, there's also a, a vigorous um, uh, discussion going on in the chat uh, about weeding um, so that um, you can make room for um, these collaboration spaces. Um, and big thanks to Sue and to Robin and to Wilma. Um, for uh, mentioning um, about the board resources. Check with your board because me most boards have weeding guidelines um, already published. And I do know a few high school teachers who have really decided that they're not using nonfiction tech um, books as much in their schools and they've really been able to cull almost half of their nonfiction in their, uh, in their high schools because they're using online databases and that has given them a lot more room to create more collaboration spaces and maker spaces. Where in elementary we still have kids who need the books and if the book is at the right reading level then it's worth keeping. Otherwise get rid of it because there's a lot of dinosaur books floating around that are at about a grade six or seven reading level and you know it's the grade one kids that are reading dinosaur books. So just wanted to share that um, uh, Marriott has um, uh, provided her email. So if anybody has any of their um, board's weeding criteria, um, if you would like to send it to her, that would be um, fantastic. And who knows, maybe Marriott might want to write an article for Kindle magazine about the different comparing and contrasting the different board weeding criteria. No pressure, though, Marriott. No pressure at all. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to put um, Melissa and Diana's email, Twitter, blogs in the in the chat box, so that if you have any other um, questions or uh, comments or ideas that you can share with them, and I'm sure Diana would love any contact to. Um, if you would like to contribute to the magazine, um, that would be absolutely awesome. So I've just put that in the chat box. So we're almost um, about three minutes to go. So if anyone has any final thoughts or questions for Melissa and Diana, that would be great. And I just have one other question. In my role, my voluntary roles as a co-chair for TELCO, which is a, a teacher librarian subject association, and as, as part of the council for OSLA, we are always um, open to suggestions or ideas that you can think we need to do at the provincial level as well. And if you don't have um, a central teacher librarian or a teacher librarian key person in your board who is coming to TELCO, we encourage you to have someone from your board represent your, your board district because there's opportunities for consortium purchasing. and. Um, it's available to all the boards in, in Ontario, but not everybody in Ontario knows about it. So you should double check and hope um, that there are representations from your board going to those subject associations because it, we, pr we produce a lot of advocacy and um, resources for teachers.
And I see that people want to get in touch with Diana and Melissa, so um, the resource page will be coming. It, it's scrolled in the chat, but the resource page will be coming probably tomorrow or Friday at the latest. So just watch out for that, and, and I'm sure that they would love your input. So just as we're winding down, I just wanted to thank you guys, uh, Melissa and Diana, for a, a great session, lots of resources for people to check out, and also the opportunities for people to um, meet other teacher librarians at conferences and, and I agree those are the places where you can um, where you can definitely connect and share ideas and, and um, also share your own learning by submitting some proposals. So great idea. Thanks so much guys. So um, I just some mm -hmm. housekeeping before we finish up. So uh, the last thing that um, we'd love you to do is to when you log out of the session you'll be directed to uh, a feedback survey, and um, the feedback survey really has three purposes. One of them is to provide OTF Connect with some feedback. The second is to provide Melissa and Diana with some feedback, and the third is to um, provide the Ministry of Education, who so graciously and generously support OTF Connect with some um, data for, um, and, and hopefully they'll continue their support of the program. So there's three ways that you can get to that feedback survey. One of them is you can just click on the link that's right on that slide and it will take you to the survey. The other one is to um, to click on the link that I'm putting in the chat box right now. And the third one is when you log out of the session, it will just take you directly to that feedback form. Once you fill out the feedback form, it will, it will send you an email that has a link so that you can download a certificate of participation. And um, and that you you know definitely using your professional portfolio and those of you who are building those. So um, we'd really appreciate if you could fill out that feedback form and it's available for um, 48 hours after the session ends. And um, we have more sessions coming up all the way to the end of May. And I see there's one with Brian Aspinall. He is actually absolutely incredible um, talking about making makerspace, making making makerspace. And uh, for those of you who are interested in integrating that into your um, learning spaces, it would be a really valuable experience uh, for you to do that. And just a word of warning, his sessions fill up very, very quickly. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, I would sign up for that like tonight. Um, he's a great presenter, lots of great um, um, information, and it's just jam-packed full of student examples so that you could see exactly how to integrate into your class. So thanks to Melissa and Diana, and if every if uh, you can log out of if everyone can log out of the session, and I'll just chat with Diana and Melissa just for a couple minutes before the end of the night. And thanks for sharing your evening with us. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. There, you're done. Have you stopped I recording? Yay. Oh.